I'd like to talk this morning about how to maintain a good conscience. We s talk about as Christians the great moral decline that we're seeing in America, and it, it, the reason is, is because the shaping of the moral conscience of young people has been separated from the foundation of the Word of God. And therefore, what was substituted for it is just the whims of society and the cultural mores of whatever generation we have now. And uh, we're drifting further and further away from the foundation of the Word of God. And rather than curse the darkness this morning, I, I feel in my heart that I would like to talk to us Christians on how to maintain a, a good conscience based on the Word of God, and also, if we're parents here, how we can shape the moral conscience of our children because they go to schools, public schools, five days a week where they're not going to learn anything about the moral foundation that we find in the Word of God. In fact, they're going to learn that God should not have any part in secular society. This is where our nation has gotten to. So it's important for us as parents to teach our children the ways of the Lord and teach our children that there should be a difference in the moral character of a Christian versus the moral character of individuals that have grown up without Christ. Say amen if that makes any sense. So let's talk first about what is a conscience. A conscience refers in general to the human moral awareness that judges an action right or wrong. I want to say that again. It refers in general to the human moral awareness that judges an action right or wrong. We find some examples in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 5, with David. Now, David was anointed the Lord. He understood the authority of God. And it says in verse 5, Afterward, David's conscience was stricken for having cut off a corner of King Saul's robe. He had, King Saul is trying to kill David. David is going to end up being king. But until he is set in by God, he knows not to touch the authority of God. So he goes, he catches Saul in his army sleeping, and rather than kill Saul, who's trying to kill David, he just cuts off a part of his robe. But his conscience was so sharp before God that it affected him greatly. Because he felt that he had done wrong, that he had touched the anointed of the Lord. That's the kind of conscience that David had. Now, he didn't have that conscience going all the time because we know he ended up sinning with Bathsheba. But he did have, the Bible says, a heart that was after God's heart, and God looked at that. He saw that he was imperfect, but there was something in his conscience that separated him out from all of those in Israel, and it was this very thing of making moral choices based upon the Word of God. He didn't do it always, but he did it quite often. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, the Apostle John wrote, Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Verse 21, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In other words, if our heart, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, most likely if our conscience is bothering us, it's because we're doing something wrong. As a Christian, we kind of have this moral sense within us that there's something wrong. I remember reading in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, he begins his famous book. And by the way, C.S. Lewis was a professor of um, English literature in one of the most prestigious universities in England. And he was an atheist who becomes a Christian. And he writes this. He said, right and wrong is a clue to the meaning of of the universe. In other words, the idea of right and wrong is a clue to the meaning of the universe. Why is there such a thing called right? Why is such a thing called wrong? And then he goes on and establishes the fact that no matter where you go in the world, no matter what age you lived in, there was a moral compass that had some kind of a foundation that most people agreed to, such as Murdering, murdering innocent people is wrong in every single culture. Okay? Except for, you know, militant Islam today. 
But in every culture, murdering an innocent is wrong. It's, it's just absolutely wrong. Stealing is always wrong. Lying is always wrong. So this idea of a moral compass is real. It is there. Now the word conscience we find in the New Testament, it comes from a Greek word that's derived from an action word which means to know with. In other words, the conscience is the knower. is what you know. And to distinguish between right and wrong is incredibly important for us and also for our children. But how do we know right from wrong? Well, the problem with the conscience is it was affected by the fall of Adam and Eve. And because of this fall, people can go around thinking they're doing good when in reality they're not doing good. Think of ISIS today. They're beheading people in the name of God, supposedly thinking that they're doing God a service, when in reality what's happening is they're killing innocent people. John, in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 2, this is what Jesus said, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you <clears throat> will think he is offering a service to God. The Islamic terrorists today are thinking they are doing God's will. The conscience is spoken in the Bible as being corrupted. Titus 1.15 says this, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. The mind is the thinker. The conscience is the ability to choose between right and wrong and to know the difference between right and wrong. <clears throat> now, conscience can be ignored, and we see this with Pontius Pilate, with Jesus. In Matthew 27 and verses 15 to 26, we're not going to go there, but in this story, we find that Jesus is brought before Pilate. Pilate listens to all of the accusations and he finds no fault in him. In fact, he even washes his hand. He knows that this person's innocent. He ignores his conscience and the conscience of his wife who said, listen, I have nothing to do with this. I had a dream about this man. I have nothing to do with him. He ignored his conscience. When you ignore your conscience, the conscience, this ability to know right from wrong, can become seared as with a hot iron. Like when you take a, a piece of meat and the first thing you do, if you have a nice steak, is if you're going to grill it, you sear it like 500 and something degrees. Not for long, you just sear the outside and what that does is it seals the outside. The Bible talks about the conscience being able to be seared in the sense that nothing else good can come inside of it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, Such teachings come from hypocritical liars who consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Someone once said that, that the conscience is like a, some kind of a three-pointed thing in our hearts that, that turns us around when we do something wrong. And these points, the conscience, it hurts. It really does. It bothers you. But if you keep doing bad, what happens to that is the points eventually wear off. And then it doesn't hurt anymore. When I think of America today, 40 years ago, the conscience of all Americans believed except for homosexuals, that homosexual was a perversion. In fact, the American Psychological Association called it a mental disease 40 years ago. It's no longer according to them. What changed? Well, conscience. The conscience of the educational system, which was severed from the foundation of the moral code in the Word of God to the place where 30 to 40 years of education without a moral conscience based upon the Word of God caused something that used to be a perversion to become now supposedly a right and a natural desire. Paul shows so beautifully to anyone who is willing to listen 
What happens when you ignore your conscience and become reprobate or void of any of the knowledge of God? He says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, the light was turned off. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, and animals, and reptiles. In other words, idolatry. Now, back in these days, they used to literally just make statues of anything that they worshipped and gave a lot of attention to. Today, we don't have to make the statues. We have television, and we have the print, where we can just go ahead and focus. Whether it's obscene pictures, whether it's pornography, or whether it's movies that might not have pornography in it, but they got violence to the place where what happens is the ability to feel any kind of a... a, 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 a compassion for anybody getting killed well the points have been worn away slowly over the years and years and years I can remember back a long time ago when uh, TVs were black and white there was no color okay and it was amazing that even during then they couldn't show blood when somebody got shot you never saw the bullet hole you never saw that. You just never did. You never even saw the blood. It wasn't until, you know, uh, Alfred Hitchcock came out with Psycho, and that was still in black and white. And that was a scary, scary show. That was crazy. But then slowly, the censorship laws were changed in America by liberal progressive thinking, which said no one should have the right especially those that are religious or Christians or Jews to tell us what is right and wrong but the idea is it's not us it is the Word of God the Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away but his words gonna remain forever so all we're doing is quoting the Word of God and we go on and we continue to quote the Apostle Paul so because man has shifted his attention off of God and God's moral standard and shifted it and made idols of, of uh, movie stars and, and rock and roll stars. And you say, well, that's not an idol to me. It takes up your time. An idol is anything that you give a tremendous amount of time to. And believe me, the way some of us are when we see our football team and our baseball team, okay, uh, win a game. I mean, we go nuts, okay. I think God maybe likes baseball. I kind of like baseball. But I don't love it to the place where it becomes an idol to me. In fact, I haven't even watched too much. When the Yankees start winning again, I'll watch them. Okay? But this is what happens, and Paul goes through a slow process that happens when we reject the moral conscience of God that he placed within us. And that's in every people on the face of this earth. In verse 24, Therefore God gave them over to their, in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Just read an article the other day where a student had something tremendous happen to their life and when they were going to read the report, they had to make a report on something that happened in your life, she was going to mention Jesus Christ. And the teacher said, you can't do that because of separation in church and state. Billy Graham said a great thing. He said, the founders of our Constitution never put the First Amendment to say freedom from religion. It is freedom of religion. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or the free exercise thereof. It's the First Amendment. The first one. It's not the second, third, fourth, fifth. The second one. Well, we're not concerned about the second one right now. It's a concern of mine, but maybe not yours. But the point is, the first one is extremely important. Not freedom from religion, which the school systems today have been taught by somebody 
until you challenge it, and then all of a sudden they become brilliant and they realize, oh, wait, we were wrong. You're right, you're allowed to express, you know, you can say the name of Jesus Christ. Soldiers in our nation are being court-martialed because they're even writing things about Jesus Christ in their Facebook, in their Twitter accounts. What is going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. They're exchanging the truth of God for a lie. In verse 26, this is what happens when we get rid of the moral compass in us or the points on the compass that God created within our conscience become so dull, they don't even prick us anymore. They don't even hurt anymore. They don't even touch our conscience anymore. This is what happens. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts, lusts of strong desires. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural relations ones. And in the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, they, since they didn't think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, think of the school systems today and the colleges today, the secular colleges. They didn't think, you know, it was um, worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God and the knowledge of right and wrong that's been the foundation of American society since the beginning. Well, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Verse 29, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, Malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, and they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of them who practice them. Think of the problems that we have in our society today. The causes of these things are because sin is in the human heart. And because there is no moral compass anymore, everyone seems it's right to do in their own eyes what is right and what is wrong. I gave you the answer to why our society is this way. What is the answer to our own lives? And what's the answer to us as parents who are going to raise children? The answer is in the word of God. You see, a good conscience can be cultivated after receiving Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. This system of right and wrong can be cultivated in us. In other words, when we are born again, God gives us a new spirit. He makes our spirit alive so we can understand his word. We can understand the principles of the kingdom of God. We can see as it is into the spirit world and understand that the devil is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. When you see all the murdering take place in the cities in America, it's the devil. You don't blame this one and don't blame human beings. It's the devil. Jesus said it. All the lying and the deceit that we hear in our American society, it's of the devil. The devil is the one who works, the Bible says, in the sons and daughters of disobedience. Those who have become reprobate are individuals who no longer have the sense of right and wrong that's in the Bible. The sad thing is, and what perplexes my mind, how did this happen in our nation, which was founded upon Judeo-Christian ethics, and 50 years ago the government used to pay millions of dollars to make advertisements on Friday and Saturday for everyone to go to your house of worship this weekend. Why did they do that? Because they understood that there are no laws, human laws, can tame the human heart. They understood that making no religion and establishing no religion did not mean freedom from religion. But religious values should be inculcated within the heart of the consciousness of America. That's why they put on the dollar, in God we trust. And now people are trying to eradicate that in the name of freedom. 
I read a story about a gang member who found Christ in prison, and he wrote this. He said, before I was in prison, I was in prison. He said, but now I'm in prison, but I'm free, because Jesus set me free. And now for the rest of his life, if he has to sit in prison, he's still free. And there's a lot of people walking around in prison and in bondage to sin. They're in bondage to things, and they don't even realize that it's a bondage. It's like the drug addict who never wants to admit he's a drug addict. It's like the alcoholic who doesn't want to admit until he loses all of his friends, he loses his family, he's got nowhere else to turn, and someone will take him in, maybe in the Salvation Army or somewhere. And somebody will talk to him and say, the only one left for you to go to is God. And guess what? God's always waiting. Because he loves the world so much, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God's not some faraway God. He's waiting for you who are listening to come to him. And if you have not received him as Lord and Savior, he's waiting for you to accept him so that he can open your eyes to his kingdom. It's a kingdom filled with righteousness, peace, and joy in his Holy Spirit. This is the life of a Christian should be. We see many Christians not living to this because they're still in bondage. Because they've allowed sin to creep into their life and affect their conscience. I felt really bad the other day. I saw a sign. For, I was in a hurry to do something before the store closed. And I saw somebody sitting. And they were sitting on two shoe boxes. I saw him actually put him down, and he sits down, and he holds up his sign, please help. And I said, oh, Lord, man, I can't do this now. I'm in the middle. If I don't do this thing, there's going to be a problem. And my conscience affected me greatly. So much for the last two days, I've been saying, maybe that was an angel, and the Lord was testing me. I'm a hypocrite. But I'm just like you. I want to help. My conscience is still there, though, you see. I could have just kind of like wrote the thing off and just said, ah, the heck with it. He's probably going to just go and buy something to drink. My conscience bothered me, and that's good. A conscience is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend the next two, three days, and every single time I see somebody on the side of the road or something like that, I'm going to stop. Especially if they got a sign saying, please help. Conscience is good. It's not bad. It's good. I remember when I was growing up and I was into Motown music and we had this saying, man, bad was good, good was bad. Man, that's bad. And I remember, I, I was in an African-American band, okay? And, uh, you know, all the Motown groups mostly were black groups. So I traveled with them and I was blue-eyed soul. I was a saxophone player. So, uh, and I go in and hear, man, man, you play bad. I go, really? Do, no, 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 no. Bad means good. I go, oh, okay, yeah. Man, I'm bad. You're bad too. You know? And we used to say that to each other. It's like, you're really bad, man. He's really, really bad, man. You know? And I remember my brothers go, you don't have to go that far. Just bad. Man, that's bad. Okay. You don't have to say really, really bad. I felt like saying, Well, if if you think I'm good, then why are you saying I'm bad? But I didn't even get into it. And it just becomes part of the culture. We twist things around. But did you realize that that's had a tremendous effect on confusing things today? Because a lot of things that are really bad are really bad. And good always stays the same. Good is good. But bad is always bad. Hmm. Wow. But a good conscience can be cultivated. How do we do this? How do we do it in ourselves? And how can we do it in our children? Well, without God's light, the conscience can be a false guide. Remember Jimmy the Cricket? And always let your conscience be your guide. Remember Jimmy the Cricket? Okay. Uh, how many people remember that? Yeah, what show was that in? Pinocchio. There you go. I like that. You know, they used to have the tell a lie. Can you imagine if every politician today, if he told a lie, they'd have schnozolas miles long, I think. You know what a schnozola is? I don't know. My father used to say it. I hope it's not a bad word. Is it? Nobody, nobody got shocked by it. But anyhow, they'd have them. I'll tell you, man, they, they would need 
a lot of aids just to be able to hold the nose up, you know, to go to a speech. It's almost as if lying has become a way of life. It's like, it's the thing to do. It's, it's okay to do. No conscience about it anymore. But conscience can be a false guide, especially if it has the wrong foundation. Acts chapter 26, verse 9. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Now, he's a, he's a religious person. He was no different than Islip, uh, Islip, I, I, Islamic terrorists today who were going around killing people, thinking they're doing God a service. Because Paul was doing the very same thing as a Jewish Pharisee. He thought he was really doing God a service, get rid of these heretic Christians. And this is what he says in verse 9 of Acts 26. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus Christ. Anytime you hear, if you read in the paper or anywhere in school systems in the government where they're refusing to allow people to say the name of Jesus Christ, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And by the way, the devil doesn't come dressed in horns. He comes with a smile on his face. He could have blonde hair, blue eyes. He could have anything. He could he'd just be a nice guy. But if it's not the word of God, it could be the spirit of Antichrist. And by the way, Antichrist just means against Christ or instead of Christ. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a human's conscience. I'll say it again. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can purify the conscience of man. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse you, your, our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Always use God's word as the standard for your conscience to determine right and wrong, and you'll be okay. That's why we should teach our children the ways of the Lord. The Jews understood that from an early age they were to go ahead and not only bind the word of God around their arms and they put that, those little things that's sticking out of their head. Looks like a mini cut off horn, but those are the scriptures. They put them on their head. God was really meaning get them inside your heart. Okay? Not just wear them on the outside. But the whole idea was to remind them of the word of God so that they live by the word of God. So their foundation was the word of God. And they understood what the psalmist said when he said, Thy lamp. Uh, the lamp of the Lord, it searches the spirit of man. And thy word is a lamp to my feet. They understood these things. If you use God's word as a standard for your conscience to determine right and wrong, you're never going to go wrong. Martin Luther said this. Not Dr. Martin Luther King was a great man, and a prophet to this nation. But Martin Luther, he lived 1483 to 1546 A.D. He said this, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I like that. My conscience, my system of determining right and wrong, to keep it sharp, to make sure that if I do something wrong, my conscience is going to bother me. I'm not just going to pass over it. I'm going to be bothered by it to the place where I'm going to, whoa. Believe me, you've got to have a good, sharp conscience today in American society. Because there's so much that's polluted in American society it comes to the moral foundation that a lot of people would even think, oh, Pastor, man, you're just getting too deep. No, I'm not. I'm just, just actually touching the surface. In fact, if you do not have a moral conscience, I can guarantee you, you'll slip further and further and further into darkness and you will think it's the light. But it's really darkness. The devil loves to put people into what they think is freedom. And then he goes in for the kill. It's his bait that he uses. I like to watch these shows there, uh, you know, uh, Alaskan bush people. And, you know, I like it. I like watching it. I don't want to go there and do it. Number one, I don't like bugs. Number two, I'm not into bears. Number three, I'm not into the cold. Okay, so, but I like watching the others do it. And they're getting paid for it and they love it. I go, well, you love it. I don't mind watching it, okay? It's better than some of the other junk that's on TV. 
But you see, when they set a snare, what do they put in there? They put in the very thing that is nourishment to the animal. For example, next time you go and try to go fishing, okay, try to put a pork chop on a fishing line to catch a fluke. It's not going to work. Fluke don't eat pork. It's not because they're Jewish or they're kosher, okay? It has nothing to do with that. It's not part of their diet. They don't have a desire for it. Now, crabs, that's a different story. You could put anything that's dead on a line because God created crabs and lobsters to eat and scavenge. They clean the bottom of the ocean floor. They eat the dead stuff. Don't put that on there, but put a killie or put a killie is a little, little fish or put a spearing on there, put a small fluke. They even, they're cannibals, they'll eat themselves. Okay, babies and stuff like that. They're going to eat that stuff. And the devil knows what he can get you with. Some of you, he gets you really cheap. Really does. Some of you are very, very cheap. The devil didn't have to spend a lot of time or anything to get you. He gets us with, you know, sex. He gets us with pornography. It's a big thing with the men. I read an article where it said 68% of all of the men in the church of Jesus Christ in America today are addicted to porn. 68%! That's the majority, if you don't know. In fact, the article even said that when they did this anonymously in churches all over America, they found out that that was true of even the ministers. It's a snare. It's all over the place. One button, boom! You're into the whole world. Pornography. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I know, men, we don't like even to think about this because you're going, uh-oh, he's real. Now he's real. I mean, I, he didn't just kind of like prick my conscience. He just popped my whole bubble here. I hope my face ain't turning red. Okay? But guess what? The women are starting to watch that stuff too. Why? It's because it's legal in America. It's legal. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. Abortion's legal. Don't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's right. And if you use that when you stand before God, he's not going to use, oh, you are an American. Oh, you're in another class. You see, you are exempt from the moral code that I had given to the Jews and to the founding fathers because you were liberal progressives. And I understood you progressed yourself right out of the kingdom of God. So here's a place prepared for you, the devil and his angels. You can't stand before God and say, well, I was just obeying the law. Because that's what all of the Nazis were doing. They collaborate. We were just obeying the law. And many of them got hung. Proverbs 20, verse 27. The lamp of the Lord, it searches the heart of a man. It searches out his inmost being. And then Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love the Word of God. It cleanses you every single day. The more you memorize the Word of God, you'll hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you all day through thoughts. I mean, if you're newly saved and you're saying, I'm hearing a audible voice from God every day, I guarantee you that's not God. Unless you're some special prophet. And I doubt that very much. But most of the time what it is, is you don't want to learn the Word of God. You don't want to read the Word of God. This is a lamp to your feet. This is spiritual food. This shapes the conscience. That's why we want our Sunday school programs to be rich in the content of the Word of God. We don't, the, we don't want them to just sing and dance and shout. We want them having a moral conscience based upon the Word of God. So that, that and believe me, this is a sharpener of your conscience, the Word of God. If you don't, you say, ah, that's not for me. And a lot of times, people are reading the Word of God to find something for their brothers or sister, the husband or the wife. How about reading it for you? I always pray over the Word of God. I say, Lord, show me something today that can change my life, that can make me know more of you. Because thy Word is truth, and you are the way, the truth, and the life. So if I know more of the truth of God's Word, then I know more of Jesus. And if I know more of Jesus, I'm not going to make so many mistakes in this life. I'm not going to get hung up. But the devil is very subtle. He's got this new thing, Charlie Challenge. By the way, every parent, you should understand what that is. It's nothing but just a disguise for the same principle that works in Ouija boards. You're actually summoning Charlie. I don't know who Charlie is, but I can tell you what it is. It's demonic. It's of the devil. It's the same principle. We are not allowed to go 
and try to get into the spiritual world by any other means other than the Word of God. And the Word of God says we don't summon the dead. We don't summon a spirit up. We don't do that stuff. If we do, we can open up a portal for demonic power to come into us. So parents, teach your kids, you're not going to do this stuff. You can't do it or else you're going to end up allowing the devil to come into your life. And if they laugh at you, then you better say, listen, we need to sit down and talk. Because if you're laughing at me, that's what the devil would try to do. It's not a joke, this stuff. Not at all. So the Charlie, Charlie challenge is out. Okay? Throw him into the sea of wickedness. That's where it belongs. Have nothing to do with it. It's nothing but Ouija boards. And Ouija boards are of the devil. They work. They're designed by the devil as these innocent little toys for kids to play on sleepovers. You know, girls do it, guys do it. They bring out the Ouija board and try to get that thing to move. You get that thing to move, you got a demon in that house. And that demon's going to sit there and try to attach to somebody. And as you're watching your porn or you're watching your violent movies, a spirit of fear will come on you, a spirit of lust will come on you. And before you know it, you got a real problem. And then you're going to have to go. Just like when you break down your car, you got to go get it fixed. So please, word to the wise. All right, let's just talk about a good conscience and how to keep it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. The Apostle Paul told Timothy this, Holding on to faith in a good conscience, some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Hold on to your conscience. Don't push it aside. It's the worst thing in the world to push your conscience aside. Now, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, but the Word of God is our guide. Don't try to go ahead and say, ah, that's for, you know, ah, I don't believe that today. And there is an active attempt by hundreds of thousands of people in American society today to try to rid America of any of the moral conscience found and based upon the Word of God. It's, it's happening right before our very eyes. While wow. supposedly still 71% of Americans still profess Christianity. If that's true, then I think that Americans and Americans Christians are pretty, their conscience has been kind of like dulled a lot. Romans chapter 14, verse 22. So whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. In other words, if your conscience is just telling you it's wrong, it's wrong. Watch your eyes, men. Make a covenant with your eyes. Soap in the newspaper and it can be so tempting. And by the way, when you're doing Google searches, even if you're not looking for porn, but if you're, you start Googling and all of a sudden you see a beautiful girl there and it says, you know, you see a picture of a beautiful girl and she's fully dressed. And all of a sudden you press the button and all of a sudden you got like 50 sites up with beautiful girls. They're all dressed nice. I'm talking about guys. Girls, you could probably be doing the same thing. Before you know it, you're searching, doing a research project and they'll keep going and going and going. And guess what? Every time you press that button, somebody on a server somewhere is recording what you like. And all of a sudden, you're going to see ads all over the place for this stuff. Welcome to the world of the internet and marketing. It's amazing. There's a written record somewhere of it on somebody's server. The internet, number two things about the internet. Number one, you can't believe everything that you read. And number two, everything that you put up there or you're viewing is being recorded somewhere. And there's a record of it. That shocks Americans, but how about the fact that every action, every word that you say, there's a recorded in heaven. And when you stand before God, you have to give an account for every idle word, let alone the words we spoke. Every idle word. Thank God I know Jesus. Because when he gets up there and that book is opened up, Jesus is going to come and say, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. His sins have been forgiven. So the book of life is open. And then we're only judged for the works that we did for the kingdom of God and for Jesus Christ. But if a person has not received Christ down here and forgiveness for their sins in this body, then everything that you've ever said or done will be revealed. What a day that'll be. You talk about a reality show. Whew. 
Let me leave you with this one scripture, and then we're going to pray for our consciences that God make them sharp, and then we'll have a time of fellowship. In Job 26, verse 6, I found this scripture. I think it's so poignant for us. It just says this, and this is a pledge of Job. He said this, I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. That's a nice pledge. I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as, as, long as I live. In other words, I want to sleep at night. I pay my taxes. I don't like to. I pay my taxes. I don't want to try to cheat the government. Plus, I majored in accounting and especially income tax accounting. And there's no statute of limitations if you have uh, deferred the government of taxes. That's why they're not caring so much about getting to you. Because they just give you enough, the sooner or later you're going to get hung. Because they can get you. Especially with the faster and faster computers out there, they'll get you. Most of us is not going to bother with because it's incidental. They, they could care less. You know, they, they understand it's chump change. If you're making less than $100,000 a year, they won't send an agent out to you probably. They'll send you a letter maybe in an audit. But if you're making millions of dollars, I can guarantee you they're going to nail you. And I read about it all the time during the day. It's kind of a hobby. You know, just reading about you know, in the income tax world and the tax world, because I kind of majored in it years ago. Know nothing about it now and glad I don't. But other than reading about it, and they're nailing more and more individuals, and they wait. Why? Because it's like a taxi cab. The IRS like the taxi cab. Once you get in it and you're in fraud, they just let the ticker keeps going. It keeps running. The interest keeps running up and running up and running up and running up and running up. So they don't care. They'll wait. They're making money. In fact, they make more money out of you than they make out of anywhere else. Because, I mean, the penalties. What are, anyone know the penalties now for, for if you didn't pay your taxes on time? It's incredible. Let's put it this way. You're going to get a bill that you won't believe it. And if you wait 10 years to do it, forget it. Your income tax bill with the interest and penalties is going to be more than your original bill. They know that. That's why they don't care. The ticker's running. Tick, tock, tick. Talk. I'm not an IRS agent. Aren't you glad? Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. I pay my taxes. But also, my conscience, though, I don't want to steal. I find money, okay? And I know somebody dropped it. I don't stick it in my pocket. Okay. When I go to the counter and the, the, the person behind the counter gives me too much change, first thing I do, I say, hey, do you own this place? And if they say yes, they're going to think about it. No, I'm only kidding. But if they're a worker in the place, okay, then I know that they're going to get docked for it, you see? I wouldn't do that either. If the guy even owned the place, I'm going to give the money. If he gives me too much money, I'm going to give it back. Why? Because God's watching. You see? And my performance down here is going to be judged by God for my rewards up there. And if I'm faithful in little things, then I'll be found faithful in much. So my conscience, I want my conscience sharp. It is not a good thing to have a good, sharp conscience if you want to have fun all the time. Because you've got to deny yourself sometimes. And take up your cross daily and follow after, you, uh, follow after Jesus. Right? Isn't that true? Some of you younger people, you've got friends that are unsafe. Hey, come on, we're going over to Billy's. Remember the, remember the big party we used He's going to have a cake. Oh, he's going to have some, you know, things there, you know, that we used to do. And all of a sudden you're, yeah. you want to go because you want to see your old friends. But you know, if you go, you're going to be infected. Really. It's like me, I don't go into Dunkin' Donuts unless I'm broke. <laughs> and then I wouldn't go in there anyhow. But doggone jelly donuts. <laughs> but I'm glad it's only a donut now that I'm dealing with, you know. There used to be a lot of the things that was worse, much worse than a donut. Although a donut can kill you if you keep having one a day for about 10, 20 years. Okay? But some other things, we want clean consciences. I'm going to read that again, Job 27 and verse 6. Would you stand to your feet right now? Maybe we can, we can kind of quote that together as a declaration. Could you bring that up? Let's say it together on three. One, two, three. I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. And see, what happens is if you start to do that in your mind and heart, it doesn't mean that you're going to go around and judge everybody else, okay? Because when you point your finger at somebody, guess where your thumb is? 
Let's try it back at you. Okay? First, get the beam out of your own eye so you can see clear enough to get the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, don't worry about anybody. Else. Worry about your own life. Be concerned about your own conscience. Work on your own conscience. And don't go trying to straighten out the whole church world. Take care of yourself. But what a conscience will do, and a pure conscience, you'll see more of Jesus. You'll see more of God. That's why some of you listening to me, I'm just, now I'm just kind of giving an advertisement for the Holy Ghost. Some of you right now are bored in your Christian experience because you're not really talking with Jesus because your conscience is defiled. Deal with the conscience, and I guarantee you the joy of the Lord will become your strength again. Amen? Bow your heads, and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, we talked about maintaining a good conscience, Lord God. We reject the mores and the moral value, Lord, that's become, Lord, the foundation of America, which is just immorality, Lord, doing whatever they want to do. We come back to the Word of God, and we pray, O oh God, for a spirit of revival, a great awakening to take place in our nation, Lord God, that you turn this nation around, Lord God. Lord, I ask you, God, that you would go into the universities this land, and Lord, get these professors, Lord God, who are atheists like you've done in the past, and Lord, put them against the wall and let them see themselves as you see them. Change their lives so that they can go and they can start, Lord God, a new revival in America, Lord God, that this nation, Lord God, would get back <clears throat> to the original foundation, Father, before something tragic happens, Lord God, in this nation. But, Father, now we're praying for us right here. Now, each one here, would you make this covenant with your eyes? And I know some of you are saying, oh, man, I got, a re I got some real changing to do. Make the covenant now and say, Jesus, by your grace, help me to get away from anything that is affecting my conscience in a way that's messing up my ability to know right from wrong in every way, shape, or form and help it to be a foundation in the Word of God. I'm going to say a prayer right now. Repeat it after me. And by God's grace, we'll make our conscience and our church holier so that we can see more of Jesus and see the power of God move in a more powerful way. We can't do it alone, just one or two. We need more people that are willing to walk according to the Word of God. And we'll see God move. Let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. Your blood cleanses all my sins. Help me to have a sharper conscience. To know right from wrong, according to your Word. Not according to America's culture. Not according to Hollywood. Not a calling, Lord God, to the music, Lord Jesus, that we hear in the world. But by thy word, Lord, for thy word is truth. Change me, mold me, make me into your image and in your likeness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.